Okay, it is 12 o'clock on the dot. I'm gonna do a little bit of a slow, slow start in case a couple more people um, join us. Um, my name is Sarah Bostic and I'm the Sustainable Agriculture Extension Agent in both Sarasota and DeSoto County with the, uni with the University of Florida. So we are located actually down here on the southeast coast of, or excuse me, southwest coast of Florida, um, about halfway down the state. Um, and I am joined today with two of my co-workers from the Sarasota County Extension Office, uh, Carol Wyatt Evans, who is the Chemicals and the Environment Agent, and Mindy Hannock, um, who is the School and Community Garden Coordinator for Sarasota County. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, so that you're about to see your screen change. Um, and I would love to start by just saying Happy New Year to everyone. We're so excited to be doing a, um, a new 10, 10 class um, run of this edible garden series. Um, if, you missed, um, if you missed the first 10 classes that we did October through December last year, uh, we will send you a link to all of the recordings. We have them all saved as YouTube videos um, so you can go, go back and watch all of them. Um, and I'm really excited to say that um, we had 199 people register for today's class. So um, clearly this is the class that folks have been enjoying and the three of us have very much been enjoying it as well. So um, if you are new to the series, the basic way we do this is um, Carol and I base pretty much take turns um, every other week teaching a class. Um, we try to keep it to 10 minutes of teaching, um, although both of us are, we generally go um, at least five minutes over that 10 minutes. Um, and then we, we um, stick around for about half an hour afterwards to answer any kind of garden question you have whatsoever. Um, and because we're a pretty big group, um, rather than unmuting your microphone, we ask that you just type your questions right into that chat box. Um, and then that way we also have a running list of all the questions that are asked. Um, and um, if we don't get to all of the questions, answering all the questions out loud, then we um, literally copy and paste your questions right from that chat box and answer them in written format. And we'll send, we'll send answers to questions um, as well as other resources um, via email in about a week. So here we go, we're gonna start in. So this, um, this is a, a series that started because we, we get so many people that come through our office or send us emails or um, call us up to say, I used to be so good at growing things and then I moved to Florida and I can't figure out how to grow anything successfully. So we hear that all the time. Um, and it is a really big shift to figure out how to grow things well in Florida. So this series really is focused in on Florida growers, but we also try to make it, um, make it just as relevant to people in other parts of the country um, and other parts of the world, because we usually have folks from different countries who join us in this series also. So, um, so today's topic, winter greens, choosing the best greens for winter growing in Florida. Here we go. So um, those of you who have been to some of my other classes know that I really like maps, especially when we can't be in one room together. Um, so, I really like maps because they help paint a picture, especially if you are from one place and have located, relocated to another place. Um, to me, it can really help, help folks figure out why certain things that they're doing or not doing isn't working. So this is a map that's basically just that, it's a, a map that's color coded by average temperature in August across the United States. So you can see something close to half the United States actually has an average daily um, August temperature between 60 and 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, down in Florida, clearly much, much hotter than that. So this is the August map. This is the same map, but this is the average temperature map for January. Um, and you may notice that, that that yellow section of the map, that 60 to 70 degree average, happens to be the average, um, the average temperature during January for the southern half of Florida. And that is where our office is located and where most of the folks who tap into resources from our office are gardening. Um, so, you know, that's, that's, a, that's really different. So basically our seasons are kind of flipped. Um, Midsummer in the northern tier of the United States is kind of what we experience down here in the winter. Um, but that's a little tricky. Um, and I'll show you why on the next map. So this, this handy little map of Florida is a map of the probability of freeze. So like, you know, solidly under 32 degrees happening um, in Florida. The, the part of the map that's on 
the left um, that has a little bit less of that coral pink color is the probability of a freeze happening just one time during a winter. And then the map on the right is of a pro the probability of a freeze happening more than once during a winter. So you can see that even though our average temperatures are kind of like the summer temperatures in a lot of the rest of the country, there's still actually a decent chance that freeze is gonna happen, which we don't really experience in the middle of August in most of the country. So that's the piece that makes gardening anything in the winter in Florida just really, really different um, than gardening in other places. So in general, the kinds of greens that you would grow in the spring, summer, and fall in most of the rest of the country are the best greens to grow in the winter in Florida, right? And so, you know, the most standard greens that fall on that list are kale, cabbage, Swiss chard, and lettuce. I love kale, cabbage, Swiss chard, and lettuce, um, but I will be the first to tell you that I get bored with nothing but kale, cabbage, Swiss chard, and lettuce. So. These are, these are four, um, four greens that do very, very well in Florida in the winter. But I'm gonna spend most of the time actually talking about um, the, the list that's not so standard, um, that actually does just as well as these, these do in the winter. So top of that list is actually most Asian greens. Um, I don't know if um, how familiar all of y'all are with Asian greens. Um, they're at some of my absolute favorite greens, just flavor wise, um, for ease of growing, for how quickly they grow. Um, they tend to be beautiful. Um, the seeds are really inexpensive and they do really well with that odd temperature fluctuation pattern that we have in the winter. Um, that fluctuates between, you know, quite, quite cold and quite warm. They do pretty well with that. So things like Chinese cabbage, which is also called Napa cabbage, um, things like Mizuna, which is a, a Japanese mustard green. Um, if you've never tried Mizuna, that's a really good one to start with. Um, it's juicy, it's kind of sweet, it's very mildly mustardy, um, and it does really well with those fluctuations of temperatures. Um, if you're growing in northern states and are looking for, for greens to grow in the fall and the spring, Mizuna is a great one for the fall and the spring in the, in the northern states. Um, and then things like tatsoi, pak choy, bok choy, there's so many different kinds of Asian greens that grow quite well in the winter in our area. Um, the, one, the one green that doesn't do particularly well that kind of fits in that Asian green category, which is it's also a really common green through much, much of Africa, is amaranth. Um, amaranth is very frost sensitive, um, but as a summer green, amaranth is actually fantastic. It's delicious. You cook it kind of like spinach. So most of the Italian and Mediterranean type greens um, are also really good for, for winter growing down here and for the spring, spring and fall in a lot of the northern areas. So things like endive, escarole, radicchio, dandelion. Um, those are things that actually will um, cold, little cold snaps will actually sweeten those greens up and make them a little bit less, um, less intensely pungent. A lot of people are a little overwhelmed by how bitter those greens are. So those are greens that you really do wanna grow at the coldest time of year. And then things like broccoli rob, which is also um, spelled in multiple different ways, including R-A-B-E, um, rapini, those are all, all the same. Um, there's also um, slightly different sprouting broccoli, um, which is a little less bitter than broccoli rob, um, Italian leaf broccoli. Um, a lot of people think that that is a made up thing. Um, it is actually not. It is, um, it's actually a variety of broccoli that has been bred to not actually really produce a head at all, but rather just greens, um, just like kale. So it, it kind of tastes like halfway between broccoli and kale. It's delicious and it loves cooler weather. Some of my favorite um, kind of winter, winter greens that have that broccoli sort of flavor, um, you can see on your screen on this little list here. Um, De Chico is a, um, is a type of, um, sprouting broccoli. Um, Happy Rich is a type of broccoli rob and Spigariello Lycia is a type of Italian leaf broccoli. Those are some of my absolute favorite varieties. Um, they grow really well in the north also just during the, the spring and fall. Um, and so, you know, we, we often get stuck on things like a head of lettuce as our salad greens, but there's so many really fun and exciting and absolutely delicious greens 
um, that you can mix together or have separately, um, you know, have, have it as like big, you know, big salads, little baby salads. There's so many ways to go about salad greens. And most of the salad greens, um, actually pretty much all of the salad greens, if you're growing them in Florida, do much, much, much better in the middle of winter than they do um, in the warmer months of the year. Most of these will be absolutely terrible and you'll have a total failure in the summer in Florida. Um, and a lot of these are actually even too heat sensitive to grow well in the middle of summer in the Northern states. So these are like the cool season. So, you know, head lettuce, leaf lettuce, um, different kinds of lettuces do better at different temperatures. Um, some of them actually really do quite well with cold weather down to like 27 degrees, some of them, just pretty incredible. Um, and then others do um, put up with heat much better. Um, there's all sorts of baby salad mixes that you can find in seed catalogs. Um, sometimes it'll be called mescaline mix or um, you know, baby mustard blends or baby lettuce mixes. Um, you may also see something in seed catalogs called braising mix. Um, braising mix is kind of the same concept as salad mix, um, except that it tends to be made of things like kale, Swiss chard, mustard, and other um, tougher greens um, that you grow until they're about three, the leaves are about three inches long. And you cut them at that stage and then they're ready for sauteing without doing any chopping. Um, they're, I love braising mixes. Um, they're, they're delicious. It's an affordable way to, to buy your own um, like sauteed green mix that you don't really have to put a lot of effort into because you don't have to do any chopping. Um, and then things like arugula, spinach, um, sorrel. Sorrel is the green that's in that picture. Um, sorrel is really lemony in flavor. Um, it'll actually, sorrel is, um, will perennialize in a lot of climates. Um, down here in the region of Florida that we're in, it's too hot, it'll, it'll die during the winter. Um, but in some areas you can actually create a little perennial sorrel patch. And then this is one of my favorite um, lists of greens for, for cold, for the colder time of year in Florida. Um, and these are, you know, these are things that you wouldn't be able to grow in the middle of winter in without some significant um, uh, greenhouse kind of frost protection and things like that in northern climates. But you can grow them really well um, in the spring and the fall in northern climates. So um, radishes turnips of all sorts, um, beets and carrots. We tend to only eat the root part of those vegetables. And in fact, we, we even call them root crops. We don't even really acknowledge the green part of, of those plants, but they, um, the entirety of all of those are completely edible and delicious. Um, I, um, I actually love sauteed radish greens. Um, if you've ever grown a bunch of radishes or bought a bunch of radishes, you'll know that the the greens have kind of like a, a fuzzy um, texture that does not seem like it would be pleasant in your mouth. Um, that is totally true when they are um, raw, um, but when you cook radish greens, that strange kind of Velcro-y fuzziness on them totally goes away. And it's just enough, any other, it, it ends up tasting just like any other um, kind of mild mustardy green that you might saute up. So don't throw away those tops. Um, and one of the reasons I put the pictures that I did on here um, is that when you, when you look at these pictures, you see that at least 50%, um, and for some vegetables even more, of these vegetables where we only typically only eat the roots, um, at least 50% of that is greens. And those greens are totally edible, but we tend to throw that part away. So just know that when you grow you know, root vegetables, they're actually kind of a two in one. You get the greens and you get the roots. Um, and then one of my very favorite um, greens that doesn't really fit into any of the other normal categories is parsley. Um, I, um, a few years ago, I went home um, to visit my parents and they, um, they shop quite religiously at farmer's markets and they had come home accidentally with a giant bag of parsley and they had no idea. I think they, they somehow accidentally, I have no idea how, bought something like 10 bunches of parsley is a lot of parsley. And um, they um, came home with it, had no idea what to do with it, started looking around for recipes and discovered that parsley is a delicious green. You can saute it just like you'd saute any other green with some garlic, a little bit of olive oil, some salt, pepper. Um, and so I regularly now um, grow huge, huge amounts of parsley for the purpose of cooking it just like any other green. Um, I often will put it over pasta or just have it as a side dish. So good. So 
the last little piece that's um, important to talk about is so in the in the more northern climates, it's a much more predictable kind of climb into cold weather. Um, and so plants kind of, they, they start this process of getting themselves prepared for the cold weather. They start to produce a different kind of um, um, like plant-based chemical that it's kind of like a, um, it's like putting on more clothing for us. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a reaction that plants start to have where they actually start producing the chemical reaction that helps them um, it helps them um, deal with really cold weather. But down here in the, in the deep, deep south, down in Florida, we're, we're just as likely to have a day that's, that is 80 degrees as we are a day in, in the 40s. And so plants don't have that progressive buildup of, um, of cold protection within them. And so temperatures that would not normally impact um, a plant up further north from here, that, that's just kind of like in winter, um, can actually be really damaged um, down here where we have such huge fluctuations in temperature. So, um, you know, even, even plants that would normally do just fine um, during cold parts of the year, um, it, it's a good idea to cover, cover things when you know we're going to drop below about 40 degrees um, in the, you know, the southern like two-thirds-ish of Florida. Um, and there's all sorts of things you can cover your plants with, um, but you don't have to get fancy. You know, this, this picture I think is a great, a, great, um, uh, a great way to see how unfancy you can be. You know, you can use things like tomato cages and sheets, um, Tupperware um, bins, buckets with a rock on top so the wind doesn't blow it over. There's also all sorts of products on the market that you can purchase um, that are often called things like frost protection, row cover, things like that. So um, in terms of knowing when to plant things, um, there's so many resources that are out there. Um, a, really, a really handy guide uh, that you can just download um, off the internet um, was put together by the University of Florida and it contains charts like this, where it tells you in the three different zones of Florida, the North, Central, and South. Um, if you're growing arugula, for example, um, in the North, you'd wanna plant those outside between September and March in the Central um, and then October planting dates. Um, and I would say that, um, you know, September, September and March are almost, uh, almost pushing it for how warm we're already getting in those stretches of time. Um, but that's a great, a great publication. And we'll send, we'll also send you some other recommendations for places you can get planting recommendations from. So in terms of where you're getting your um, seeds and seedlings, um, I would really recommend um, as much as you can finding them from local producers. They're going to be growing and, and selling varieties that do well wherever it is you live. Um, in a lot of the a lot of the big box stores and things like that, they're selling the exact same varieties um, across the entire nation, um, and they don't they don't always do well um, across the entire nation. So. Um, definitely, definitely do some little bit of work to find varieties that do do well wherever it is that you live. Um, and then, if you're looking for seed sources, there's lots of lots of um, seed companies that specialize in in southern seed varieties or have really good information about southern seed varieties. That being said, the caveat to that is that most of the planting recommendations, even in those seed catalogs that specialize in southern seed varieties, they they don't actually have they don't tend to have good planting um, date guidelines for the southern half of Florida. Um, we're just in a, such a different climate zone. So that's what I've got for you today. I went solidly over um, the amount of time I intended to talk, which is no big surprise, um, but hopefully that gives you some ideas um, for getting, getting started um, gardening um, with greens in, um, in warm places during the winter.